You guys want to find gold? I'm going to teach you the secrets of geology so you can find it. And along the way, I'm going to give you some of my tips and tricks so you'll be successful out in the field. You see those mountains in the background? Those are the Black Mountains of Arizona. They produced over 2 million ounces of gold. We're not far from Gold Road or Oatman. You have to ask yourself, why did this area produce so much gold? And the secret to that is because it sits on the outer margins of a collapsed caldera. Most of your major gold deposits in the world actually sit on the outer margins of collapsed calderas. Now, why are collapsed calderas a perfect place to find gold? Because they create the perfect environment for epithermal and porphyry deposits. Now, for those of you that don't know what a collapsed caldera is, it looks something like this. A caldera is a large cauldron-like hollow that forms shortly after the emptying of a magma chamber in a volcano eruption. The collapse is triggered by the emptying of the magma chamber beneath the volcano, sometimes as a result of a large explosion or volcanic eruption. The flanks of the volcano see fissure systems crack and open up as well. If enough magma is ejected, the empty chamber is unable to support its own weight of the volcano if it is above it. Circular fracture or fault ring develops around the outer edge of the chamber. Ring fractures serve as feeders for fault intrusion which are also known as ring dikes. And the reason why that they're perfect for creating epithermal deposits and porphyry deposits, they generate a lot of heat off of that magma chamber. And as it rises, so it creates nice little fractures and fissures in the basement rock. As it begins to cool, steam comes off of it, mostly in the form of carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and water vapor. This is especially true if it's a felsic magma chamber. By the way, don't touch these, okay? Once they get their hands in you, you're not getting them out. Now the way that you get different compositions inside of your magma chambers is for a whole nother video. But just know there's three classifications for them. Mafic, intermediate, and felsic. Felsic is gonna be responsible for the majority of your gold deposits. Felsic is gonna be anything high in silicon, like rhyolite, dacite, and of course its intrusive counterpart is granite in the granitoid family. Now the caldera we're standing in right now is the Silver Creek Caldera. It erupted 18 and a half million years ago and it was classified as a super volcano. It was so massive, it ejected an ash plume with pumice and country rock as far away as Barstow and all the way into Kingman. And in fact, you can still see some of this ash flow in the form of tuff outside of Kingman, Arizona on the interstate. It's called the Peach Spring Tuff. Thickest parts of the ash flow tuff was recorded at being 140 meters deep. In fact, if you look up on the ridge here, you can still see remnants of it right there see that white band all the way across that's part of the ash flow tuff that was ejected out of this super volcano here's a good example of the ash flow tuff that was ejected out of this caldera now keep in mind after a massive explosion all that material goes up in the air a lot of it's going to come right back down and that's exactly what this is and this tuff extends all the way to barstow and to kingman if you can imagine how large that is the only thing we have that's even close to that is pinatubo and krakatoa and those were very minuscule compared to the size of this eruption. Here you can see the west side of the caldera has completely eroded away, leaving only the east side, which is west of Oatman. In this aerial view, we're looking northwest. You can see the moss mine in the background, which is on the outer margins of the collapsed caldera. And the reason why I'm telling you this is because if you start looking for these collapsed calderas and you overlay it with MRDS, and then you overlay that with known mining areas, and then a geological map, you're gonna see a large pattern start to form and that will tell you exactly where you need to prospect for potential load deposits. What you're looking for is any of the fault systems that are radiating out around the fracture rings of these collapsed calderas on the outer margins. And sometimes these fault systems are actually gonna cut through it. Those fault systems are the ones that are gonna be the richest. We're currently sitting on the Mallory Fault Line, which extends all the way into Oatman, and it connects up with the Tom Reed Mine. This is a hydrothermal deposition model. It has a 75 to 80 degree dip, and it trends to the northwest. The values on this vein start off at a quarter ounce per ton on the surface, and at 55 feet, it reaches an ounce and a half. Now, the quartz vein itself is hosted in green chloritic andesite. It looks like this. It's got chloride in it. And that's important we'll cover that later now on this vein you're looking for any iron staining with black specks of manganese oxide running through it those are going to be the areas that produce the most gold now when you're sampling low deposits there's several ways you can do it once you've done your research and you know what you're looking for you can go around the mine dumps and you can pull out grab samples or you can actually take chip samples off the vein itself or what you can do is get yourself a small hammer drill battery powered and you're going to literally drill into areas that have high mineralization in them and you're going to collect that up and then pan that directly with jet dry <laughs>
This area is so rich with gold that they're still mining it today. I'm sure you've heard it, it's called the Moss Extension Mine. It's a large open pit heat bleach and they're getting about a gram and a half per ton. The original Moss Mine was found in 1863 by Johnny Moss and was so rich that they pulled out $240,000 in gold out of a 10 foot hole. The mine is currently owned by Vertex Mining Corporation and is being developed by open pit mining using heat bleaching as a method of extraction of metals. After the blasting cycle is complete, the ore is removed and hauled to a series of crushers where it's brought down to a very fine size of a quarter inch mine. The ore is then transported on the huge leach pads where it's leached out using sodium cyanide. I don't know if you can see it, but I've got some of the locals over there kind of hanging out, looking at us to see what we're up to. I think they think we have food. Now a couple of websites you're going to use to help facilitate locating these places is mylandmatters.org and the nice thing about that is it's got a feature on there where it has MRDS so you click it and it'll actually show you those reports. The second one is mindat.org. This is a fantastic site that gives you more supportive information on the mines, type of material they were mining, the, all this other information you're not going to find on MRDS. It's fantastic and it's very supportive. This is the shaft of the moss mine. The shaft drops down 800 feet, but luckily there's a plug here so I don't fall into it. You can see that it's cut in this beautiful rhyolite. The host materials were quartz, quartz agillaria, calcite, and hematite. This is a classic example of the hematite that they were finding that was extremely rich. This is the original rhyolite dike that Johnny Moss found back in 1863. And if you recall what I told you earlier in previous videos, this rhyolite can host some of the richest gold deposits you'll ever find. And I'm sure there's still plenty of gold over here as well. You've got Gold Road in the background and Oatman right on the other side of that ridge. We're on the very outer margins of that caldera. Now the placer deposits out here are obviously derived from the load deposits. Now for placer deposits, you're gonna look at Silver Creek and you can see a large percentage of that around Mount Hardy and over on the south side of Boundary Cone, which is a rhyolitic intrusion. But make sure you do your research first to make sure you're not claim jumping because a lot of this area is claimed up, especially by the locals and they wouldn't appreciate you coming out here and claim jumping. In fact, speaking of locals, if you do go into town, ask them. Some of them are kind enough to show you exactly where the plaster gold's at. Now I'm sitting on top of a small feeder dike, a basalt dike, and what's nice about these is that they cross any type of a potential gold bearing wash, and because it's such a hard material, it resists erosion, and it's perfect for capturing fine pieces of gold. So if you're gonna sample, this is what you're looking for. And if I was you, I'd go out and get a nice dust buster and it's got a trap in the end. That's very important because you don't want all the material to come out. What you're gonna do is vacuum up all these cracks and crevices. Now, the first thing you're gonna do is you're gonna mark where that came from. Because out in the field, you're gonna take maybe five, 10, 15, 20 samples. You're gonna forget where they all came from. So make sure you mark it. This is gonna give you a snapshot what might be coming down through these washes. And that's very good if you're gonna be dry washing for placer gold. When you're running samples, make sure you use jet dry in the water. Very important to break that surface tension. Because if not, that ultra fine gold will literally float on the top of that water. Now, if you want to run your chip samples or your grab samples in the field, I highly recommend getting one of these. It's called the Mighty Mill, and we got it from Southern Oregon Prospectors. Thanks, guys. It's great for running small amounts. And I have to stress that again, small amounts. These are not production mills, okay? You'll burn these bearings out and the motor if you run this thing continuously. And don't put something too big inside of these feed tubes because it'll jam up. Now I got all the samples that we collected up today. I have to break these down so they'll fit inside of that feed tube. So we're gonna run them down and pan them out and see what we got. Then we're gonna go ahead and pan out this guy right here to see if we got any plaster gold in it. So keep in mind, if you're running soft rock like limonite, it doesn't need a screen because you'll plug the screen up fast. But if you're running really hard rock like quartz, put a screen in it. Yeah, you see what I mean? I, I jammed that screen up because it had some of that limonite from the moss mine. <clears throat> All right, I'm losing my son fast, so I got to hurry and pan this out. All right, let's get over here. And yeah, you're gonna get wet. Yeah, there goes my son. There goes my son.
All right, let's take a look. Get my glasses on so I can see. Very, very fine gold. Remember, when you're checking load gold, bring a jeweler's loop. 10 times is perfect. There's definitely gold in it. It's really, really tiny. So what I'm gonna do is I'll put a snapshot up at the end so you can see what it looks like. All right, let's pan out the plaster gold and see what we get. See what we get. glasses on so I can see black scent oh yeah look at that little little tiny pieces of gold right here I don't know if you can see it I'll throw a snapshot of that up too. see it little tiny tiny pieces now, before you go running out here, make sure you check land status, okay? Well, I'm gonna get on out of here because the sun is setting and it's gonna get cold out here real fast. Now, if this video has enriched your life in any way, I'd really appreciate it if you subscribed and smash that like button. And if you wanna join our community of like-minded gold miners, go ahead and become a premium patron. We have multiple tiers for you to sign up to and it's a great place to meet other people who wanna find gold just like you. So until next time, this is Jeff Williams saying you want to learn geology so you can find that gold. Follow all my tips. You'll do it, but you'd better do it before you're too old. Take care, everybody.